with all our guests in you know, the rendezvous. Mm -hmm. I think we're all here except um, <laughs> for Minister Pisano, uh, who couldn't yes. make it because um, she got called into an emergency cabinet meeting. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Then we begin. Don't call out to all your. I I I uh, just um, dear experts panelists present with us in this meeting. I'm truly honored to meet you, and it's a great pleasure to be able to animate this uh, uh, debate in your company. To be able to make this exchange that I hope is that it is above all for humanity. I would like, dear guests. Your Excellency, Madam Minister, she's not present with us. Uh, panelists, to be able to speak to you in my native language, in the Arabic language, since we are in a meeting of the United Nations, the best human place to allow exchanges between all humanity. That is why I will make the introduction of our debates in this session in Arabic. And I say, في حالة الطوارئ كمثل هذه التي نعيشها اليوم، وكمثل الكوارث الطبيعية المختلفة وغيرها من أشكال الكوارث، تتأثر. This extraordinary situation that we have been experiencing in different parts of the world, our life is changing in every corner of the world. Our planet is also changing due to various events, uh, natural disasters and emergencies. This gives rise to the feeling of humanity. And we have simply to change our lifestyle, our routine daily lifestyle. People are cut off uh, from their jobs, schools are closed down, same goes for the centers of culture. Nothing works as usual. Frequently, frequently, these institutions are not available. We can see that this is happening in different parts of the world. And this is caused by uh, the coronavirus pi pandemic. The changes in the world are unprecedented. However, digital technologies carry the potential and it gives us a ray of hope that we will be able to leave the crisis behind and we will be able to blossom in the future. Classical traditional approaches cannot be applied anymore and we start thinking now in a different way. We are much more focused on digital technologies. So we should think about uh, what role uh, digital technologies and uh, um, digital innovation may play in the future in different domains of our lives, uh, education, industry, agriculture, in the new digital era. It gives us a lot of problems and it also gives rise to a number of questions guests who will take part with us in the debate of this session around around the chosen theme i begin with uh, mrs pufzili mlambu niguka from the united nations woman executive director hello mr youngly from the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, the director, director general. Hello, hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you Thank too. You. I'm very glad to meet you. Thank you. Mrs. Gabriela Ramos, she is the assistant director, director general for social and human science from the UNESCO. Hello. hello. Great to see you. I'm glad to see you and to meet you too. Um, Ms. Mr. Mario Simoli from the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, the Deputy Executive Secretary. I'm glad to meet you, is Mr. 
Simone with us. Yes. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, the pleasure is for me too. And uh, Mr. Andrew Sullivan from Isaac. Hey, the... are, are you with us? I am. Pleasure to meet you. Glad to meet you too. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Jos Calmer. That's all right. Ah, yes, um, you got it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me too. You are the, the head of global uh, public policy and government relations. That's right. That's right. Okay. Glad to meet yep. you. Thank you. Mr. Really Lapalainen. Lapalainen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Hello. Nice Hello. to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. You are the director of Sustainable Development. Fingo, Sustainable Development. I'm glad to meet you too. And Mrs. Claire Melamed from Global Partnership for Sustainable Development, the data. Hi, lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to meet you too. And for, before we begin, I just want to uh, set the scene for the discussion ahead. We are going to ask our speakers to give a very specific uh, uh, example of uh, how the internet or, uh, or related, uh, related technology has been used in support of social cohesion in times like COVID-19 or a specific example of how the internet has empowered vulnerable groups. And please try to find examples from the real world, something that has happened and uh, that stand out as an example. And I begin with um, Mrs. Fumzila Malombo Nguka. Please begin. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the panelists. Uh, the one um, example that I would like to uh, pick up uh, that uh, has been important for us during this time of uh, the COVID-19 shendo pandemic of violence um, against women. And an example that uh, is important for a large number of women in the world, given that uh, the increase of violence against women uh, in the midst of the sh shadow pandemic is something that has been felt by women all over the world. Uh, the violence increased up to 40% in some parts of, 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 of the world. So we have seen the importance of instant messaging services with the geolo geolo geolocation uh, function where women can send the message about their situation and ask for help in a discreet way without uh, the uh, observation of the, of the, of the abuser. Uh, the Secretary General uh, and ourselves sent messages to member states to create the hotline in those countries and 145 countries responded positively, but not all of them uh, obviously uh, uh, worked optimally. But I want to highlight, for instance, the response that we got uh, in a collaboration with uh, Twitter in a campaign that is called the Is Help Campaign. Countries such as Thailand, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, South Korea, and, and Vietnam, people there, the women there used the service very much and they were able to report violence against them and to get services back. But uh, for all the countries in the world, we have provided a portal of where you can get information about what services are available in your country. That portal is housed by Facebook for us, which means that therefore anywhere in the world, you can have access to the, that information and it, and it will tell you where services are available in your country. But the caution I will make is that the majority of women in the world still don't have smartphones and are not connected. 
we need solutions that are viable for women who do not have these kinds of services, who have feature phones and who are not connected in the internet. And I would like to hear more if some of you have got uh, suggestions for us along those lines. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Mrs. Uh, Fumzil Malombo Nguka. And now I want to go to Mr. Young Lee. Just in one minute, please. Uh, one minute. Uh, uh, it's just I, to give us just one example. Uh, we don't get into the heart of the debate. It's just okay. introduction. OK. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think a UNIDO is a special ed agency uh, on the intellectual development to, to support SDG Go9. So uh, uh, two things here, the pandemic uh, gave, gave us a big challenge. Uh, now we actually uh, applied some of the innovative way to use uh, digitalization technology uh, for uh, PPE production and also uh, waste management uh, uh, treatment and also the uh, how to chasing those uh, patients uh, and also create uh, some of the innovative way to identify the uh, chain of the uh, infections. Uh, those are very widely applied. A second is, uh, example is uh, we uh, use a digital technology to support uh, uh, production manufacturing, especially in agriculture sector. Uh, like uh, uh, ego, they use drone system, uh, use uh, internet of things for the uh, uh, geothermal project management, operational management. And uh, uh, at the same time, we also uh, develop an innovative way for uh, education, educational purposes because uh, virtual training, uh, visual reality training is so powerful connected to any corner of the world no matter it's uh, located in the remote area or the city center, this is a, a kind of training platform we created for them. And uh, finally, it's a social inclusion. As my, uh, my colleague from UN Women mentioned that uh, most vulnerable group, women and also young people, uh, women because they usually work in the textile uh, garment industry will be mostly affected by the uh, new technology uh, connected to the uh, digitalization or so. Uh, that is why we uh, create a special program for uh, this kind of trainings for women entrepreneurs and uh, women to get knowledge to upskill up uh, their technology uh, to find the job, to meet the job opportunities, young people at, at the same time. So uh, uh, we, we are continuing this uh, innovative uh, approach we believe this uh, is a very daunting task for us, for all the international community. We will would like to work with our partners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the example for Mrs. Gabriela Ramos. I, I just need to ask you to respect the time. Just one minute. So more. Very, a very little fast. more, a little more. Great to, great to be with all of, uh, of my friends in this panel. Uh, let me tell you that UNESCO, who, which is, of course, the, the institution that is related to education, uh, science, uh, communication, and, um, and um, resources uh, for internet, uh, we are very worried about the disinformation that has been inundating the networks and the, and the fact, uh, uh, false uh, uh, data that has been also distributed. And therefore, uh, we have launched a, a campaign with the European Union to counter this disinformation using the same tools that those that spread a conspiracy theories uh, use, using hashtag things before sharing. And I think it has a very good impact in terms of uh, countering uh, the lack of a substantive uh, basis to, to share information that is not true. But we also have an open education resources networks of fact checkers, media and information literacy resources to counter the spread of this disinformation and using the internet for good because what we are, are, are trying to advance is informing the real issues that are related to the COVID spread, the real issues in terms of the economic and social impact and the real issues related to the uh, good use of internet in this current situation. And, and finally, we are, of course, I will talk about this later. We are advancing on the elaboration of a recommendation on ethics of artificial intelligence that I think will provide 
for very good basis on all these issues. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Gabriela. And now to Mr. Mario Simoli. We're hearing you. Mm, Mr. Mario Simoli. Hola, me escuchan, gracias. Eh, voy a dar dos ejemplos que nos parecen importantes y que estamos discutiendo en la nueva reunión ministerial que se va a tener en Cepal y preparando la acción con los ministros de la región de toda América Latina. El primero tiene que ver, una de las, las crisis esta golpeó muchísimo a lo que se define el sector informal de la economía. Es un sector que ha sido fuertemente golpeado sin trabajo y es muy difícil the informal sector which is uh, the um, gray zone these people have been left outside without job without anything it's very difficult for them uh, to uh, fight for financial support these companies uh, work uh, and they exist but in a way they don't exist at all it's a difficult subject so digital platforms which are available uh, on the basis of mobile telephony allow them to have contact, but it is easier in the teleinformation sector, in ICT, because these people are much more competent in uh, aspects that are related with uh, ICT technologies, and they are able uh, to apply for subsidies or just money to uh, somehow survive, because this is also what we are talking about. It's very important for that access uh, uh, that uh, is going to be done at the informal level. Now it is at the level uh, of 50%. Another thing is also about the provision of access to platforms in a hierarchical ways, which would not discriminate small and medium-sized enterprises, which constitute 80% of jobs uh, all over Latin America. And now they simply have to sell their products. And frequently they have to do this vis-a-vis -vis internet platforms. Uh, uh, they uh, have uh, to cope with different bureaucratic difficulties. And this is what we have to talk about and we have to remember that. Uh, uh, and uh, we simply have to make sure that what is digital must be positive. What is digital, digital world uh, generates uh, problems. Uh, well, uh, remote work, remote education touches on these problems whose life is the most difficult already now. In Latin America, 36 million children have problems with that. And 6 million of children have no access to any internet, any education in recent months. And this requires uh, structural changes. And these are just a few examples uh, that are I think we lost you. There is some problem in the connection. Now, now you are with us. Yes, please. Yes. We continue the session? Yes, please. Okay, mm. okay. And now uh, I want to talk to Mr. Sullivan to, to give us uh, her example, firstly, in introduction. Sure. Um, so we're in actually an example right now. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're actually having an example of, of the sort of thing that the internet allows us to do despite the fact of pandemic. But I want to give a different example. Uh, this week, I had the, the terrible misfortune, a, a colleague uh, of mine from a few years ago died very suddenly, a uh, young man and his family is spread all over the place. And, uh, you know, the travel restrictions that are a necessary fact that we're facing today are uh, meant that they couldn't come together for the funeral, which was in Ottawa in, in Canada. So, you know, we used the internet, we, uh, we gathered virtually, it was not the same thing, of course, it's not the same. But it gives us the ability to reach out and to try to restore some sort of normalcy in an era that is extraordinarily challenging for every person. So I think it's really important to remember that this is the kind of, of thing that we can get from the internet an advantage that we just didn't have in any other period of our lives. If this had happened, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it would have just been devastating. Nobody could have reached one another. Nobody could have shared, uh, you know, their uh, reminiscences of my colleague. And it was very affecting. And I think that this is something that we must remember. The internet does provide us with these opportunities that we just didn't have otherwise. Thanks very much for this efficient example. And now I want to ask the same question to give us an example to Mr. 
Aruleba Ghosh. Mr. Aruleba Ghosh, are you with us in this meeting? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. I don't have the possibility to see you on screen. Where are you? I'm here. I can see you. I can see everyone else. I don't okay. Know. Okay. What's, uh, what are your example in this context? Yeah. So um, I'll just give um, two examples. One is at a national level, the introduction of an app called Arogya Setu, which was downloaded by 100 million people in the first 40 days as a contact, contact tracing app. Um, that was introduced in April. Now, of course, there were issues or concerns raised about the kind of uh, whether too much information about individuals was being taken or whether all the bugs had been fixed, etc. But at least it gives you an idea of the scale that can be reached very quickly in a country like India. But at the other end, from a civil society point of view, uh, in India, several crowdsourcing platforms like Keto, Mila, Rangde, etc., have helped individuals raise funds uh, for several causes to support vulnerable communities. And in many scenarios, these platforms had to spend much more through their service fees than uh, what they made through it. And in the and during the, the pandemic, they've been able to make these platforms available for free. Again, it demonstrates that if we are able to democratize uh, access to the internet and related services, we, are, we can then try to make sure that there are sufficient channels by which the vulnerable could be reached. Uh, in India, in fact, access to the internet is, the cost of access to the internet is in fact the cheapest in the world, um, uh, uh, according to Forbes. But that doesn't mean everyone has access to the internet, but it again demonstrates that this is a tool that has to be used um, as widely as possible, especially when there is physical disconnection. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. And now I go to Mr. Rili Lapalian. We're waiting for your example, concrete example. Is Mr. Lapalian with us in this meeting? Yes, Can sorry, I? I was muted. Yeah, thanks a lot for the question. I, I try to be very, very concrete. I'm, I'm taking the example what exactly the Finnish university students but the idea when they wanted to uh, really connect about the technology and the education and then really have the global perspective on that, they created CodeBus Africa, which they put together the African and the Finnish innovators in the technology and education. And the CodeBus inspires the youth to discover and make use of the technologies in their lives and empower especially the girls to explore technology uh, possibilities for their future. And, and the bus concretely went to uh, the different African countries. Uh, it was supported by the Finnish embassies in different African countries. And, and practically um, they collect young people, different ages uh, in the schools, also in the youth clubs, in the places where the youth exist. And, and they gave the access for, for the kids to, to play the computers, learn skills for simple coding. And that exactly the project reached altogether 1,900 young people in 10 countries. And it's been extremely interesting exercises. And I might share the video through the chat channel. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Lapalian. And now we go to Mrs. Claire Melamed. Are you with us in this session? I am. Thank you very much. Um, so our mandate as an organization is to work on data and information that will help governments to help some of those vulnerable communities and deliver social cohesion. And of course, this is all the more important in a time of the pandemic. We were, we were invited by the UN Economic Commission for Africa in March to work with them on developing partnerships so that governments, particularly across Africa, could have access to the data and the technology and the tools that would help them to deliver the right responses to COVID. And particularly, I want to talk about Sierra Leone, a country we've been working in for, uh, for several years. And of course, um, in a country like Sierra Leone, which has you know, serious um, big social issues, economic issues, and a lot of people who are often missing from the data. If a, if a government can't see you in the data that it uses to make it to, 
to make decisions, it can't help you. Mm -hmm. So we pulled together a number of different companies and using the power of the internet, we're able to combine data sources. So data from surveys, from census, also from satellite imagery, from mobile phone companies and combine that. And of course, it's when you combine data that the real magic happens and you're able to create that 3D picture of a society that we were able to deliver to Sierra Leone the most granular data that they've ever had on the population and really helped the, the government to understand where the vulnerabilities are, where people are most in need of help. And of course, now that we have the good news about vaccines and, and other um, developments, it's going to allow that help to get to the most vulnerable people much faster. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I congratulate you all for this uh, efficient action uh, into the uh, digital uh, technology to bring it to the developed countries, developed population. And now uh, we get into the heart of the debate of our session. Let me ask you questions inherent in the specifics related to the activities of each of our guests and each of our guests is kindly invited to answer the question that will be asked in four minutes. Please don't exceed them. And my first question will be addressed to our uh, our guest, not from Italy, Mrs. Paola is not is absent, to, to Mr. Mrs. Fonzai Mlambo Nguka from the United Nations Home Executive Director, a report by the Web Foundation on digital gender equality highlighted that women around the world still face multiple barriers, much more than men in accessing the internet. The report also highlighted the need to look beyond access, but also to ensure that women and girls can use the internet in a meaningful way. What does such a meaningful internet choice mean to you? And why is this important, especially in context of the internet as driver for social development? Thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. Uh, let me first uh, congratulate uh, my colleagues and friends at the World Web Foundation uh, for this uh, very thoughtful report. Uh, women and girls uh, need access uh, to the internet in order to uh, address their challenges and development uh, needs. Uh, as we speak now, there isn't equal access to the internet. Digital divide is a reality. 1.7 billion women uh, in the global south are not connected, as well as uh, the fact that uh, roughly 327 million fewer women than men have a smartphone and an access to an, a mobile internet. Again, I, I, I ask that uh, we try to use the products and the and the gadgets that people have. So we must keep up, keep thinking about the people who, don't, who do not have the internet while we are increasing those who are connected. The meaningful use of the internet at the hour we are in now is the, is the enabling access to digital education as well as remote education. I think I don't have to explain this to, to this group we know how much it is causing a problem. That's uh, there are some other children whose education has continued uh, while we have been under lockdown and some children whose lives have been at a standstill. Some children who have been uh, exposed to harmful practices such as trafficking, uh, forced marriage, because they have been at home away from a, a place of safety that the school provides. The, possibility of not being connected while we are at home and having work to do has meant that children have been left alone, wandering, especially where there were no adults uh, caregivers to be with them. The importance of connectivity for women also is access to health information. We know that when women get connected, they are known to search mostly for health related information and for information to help them with doing their 
online business, no matter how small. That is actually quite significant because that is one way of addressing and averting poverty of women. And thirdly, uh, uh, access to finance. In countries, Kenya is a special uh, case where digital finance has penetrated significantly. Women were the biggest beneficiaries. It, it, it reduced poverty because women were able both to control their own income and, and financial resources, but also to reduce the traveling uh, that they needed in order to go and seek for finance. And they had uh, cash in order to invest in their small businesses. To be excluded from uh, internet connectivity is to be shut down out of the 21st century. And that has ghastly uh, uh, results on the lives of people because uh, this is a service that is so huge in our lives at this moment. If we are to have equality, there has to be equal access to this uh, service uh, that is digital. And that is why I would regard it as a human right, not as a luxury. Thank you. Thank you. The clarifications provided by uh, Mrs. Uh, Fumzil Malombo Neguka as to this battery of measures that should be taken, especially in countries that are engaged by the technological tide at the level of many, many countries around the world, and the prospect that this can open up to women crying ideas and projects with different aims are very useful. Uh, it should uh, allow to discriminate to discriminate millions of women around the world that many socioeconomic political factor prevents to enjoy otherwise simply accept this case for a better future life and now mr longley united nations industrial development organization you need you are the director general uh, my uh, question, question is this, the, the, the following. One of UNIDO's goal is to help advance inclusive and sustainable industrial development, development. In your view, what is the value of digital innovation in contributing to such inclusive and sustainable development across sectors and industries, as well as in multi takes hold of a partnership between public and private sector and with the civil society. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me begin with uh, uh, three uh, numbers. Uh, first is uh, uh, access to the uh, internet. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, uh, access to digital uh, uh, technology uh, for European household is 86.5%, uh, 17.8% uh, 17 uh, for Africa, and uh, globally, the 53.6%. And uh, also, uh, many of the information regarding educational opportunity and um, uh, digital manufacturing capacity, uh, I do not want to mention too many of those uh, uh, factors. A uh, big challenge facing by the global community and also um, uh, by UNIDO, how to reduce the divid, uh, uh, digital divide and also incapability between advanced country and developing country. Those are critical challenges for us. Uh, I uh, believe that UNIDO is doing something uh, innovatively. Uh, we support the country's uh, government to develop an industrial strategy which covers digitalization Fourth Industrial Revolution Technologies. Uh, we develop a program for country partnership focusing on the industrial strategy. Now more than 10 countries in Africa, Morocco, Egypt, Senegal, Ethiopia, et cetera, and uh, one in Asia, uh, one in uh, cent Central uh, 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 CIS country, and Lac region also. Because uh, uh, this is an important process to support the government to develop uh, important strategy, to develop a digital infrastructure investment or so. A second part is our TC programs actually really bring the new technology uh, created by the, uh, the new in, uh, industrial revolution and digital uh, technology. For instance, uh, we uh, help a country 
to, uh, to, to develop manufacturing uh, with a more efficient way and a safe, safer uh, way through the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and the uh, internet of things uh, to achieve the sustainable city. And the uh, 3D printing also can help us provide a sustainable housing. Uh, th those are the uh, important approach for our TC programs. As I mentioned in agriculture sector, we had widely used uh, digital technology. Of course, uh, COVID-19 actually gave us uh, a good opportunity to help our member countries uh, build back better, uh, how to actually uh, prevent uh, the uh, infections, digital technology, artificial intelligence already being widely applied. And also private sector, we support the private sector uh, because uh, uh, robotics, virtual reality can help uh, the, the private sector remove from much of the danger from the factory operations, reducing industrial safety risks. And also we are uh, uh, aware that potentially negative implications of the new digital, digital work, workspace for physical mental health. Uh, those are the, uh, some specific area we work with private sector. Also, uh, we uh, strongly support the dig digital net technology to help the social, uh, to achieve the social inclusion and the well being. As uh, I mentioned, that uh, the education uh, of the technology uh, uh, related to the digital technology, digital education, we use the platform for the visual uh, uh, reality training especially for women, for young people, uh, because uh, it really will bring lots of new jobs and uh, get rid of some of the jobs uh, will suffer, uh, will be suffering for the women, but at the same time, they will get a new slot of the new jobs. This is uh, one of the specific area we are working. And uh, also, uh, I just would like to say that for global agenda, we are also very innovatively, that's a climate change as a big issue, but look at the industrial, industrial development. One third of the emission actually derived from the industry manufacturing and uh, energy 30% of power are used by the manufacturing. So uh, during this process, how to achieve green industry uh, re reduction of emission from the manufacturing activity is uh, so important for us. So we promote new technologies like a clean production centers, renewable energy centers to support our mobile country develop technology necessary to support the climate change issue. So uh, green industry, decarbonization of the industry is our global agenda. So having said that, I just would like to Thank conclude. You, uh, you need to uh, commit strongly to the uh, international partnership with our member countries, governments, private sector, civil society. And uh, we would like to continue this process uh, to achieve the uh, new uh, developments to build back better and SDG goal, climate change uh, global agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So including all peoples around the world in this development effort could be useful in the sense of wealth creation, including private operators and civil society actions will be targeted and consistent and will involve a large part of vulnerable societies and or complex in this general development effort. Thank you for this perspective that you have up and up. And my qu next question will go to Ms. Gabriela Ramos. Ms. Gabriela Ramos, what are the possible risks to be aware of when developing and deploying digital solutions in emergency situations such as COVID-19? And what can be done to mitigate these risks, notably in terms of protecting human rights? What are UNESCO's concrete actions or strategies to address the possible challenges and inequality that the development and deployment of digital technologies bring to light. Please, Mrs. Ramos. 
thank you so much. Uh, but let me start by saying that uh, controlling the risk of uh, of uh, the digital transformation, but also the the artificial intelligence, which is at the core of these technologies, is not only a challenge for emergency situations. We are in the context even before the pandemic, when we know when we knew that the rule of law that needs to exist online is a still in construction. And many of the rules and the institutional setting and the, and the tools that we have developed offline, the enforcement of laws, the redressing mechanisms, the, the allocating of responsibilities and accountability issues uh, in terms of the, of the decision making in, in governments and private institutions are still in, in real need to be built up in the, in the internet. And we still don't have a common understanding of how to move into this. Uh, some of the major players like the US have focused more on light touch regulation, uh, uh, favoring innovation and having a more voluntary standards for, for the industry, while some other regions like Europe are more concerned about security and safety. And therefore, there, there's also a need of a common approach internationally to deal with these issues. Now, it is true that with COVID and with the massive movement into the online for solutions in terms of the pandemic with the track trace and uh, the test track and trace technologies uh, that is uh, uh, getting into massive uh, gathering of data with the teleworking. Uh, we know that in some countries that had 7% teleworking, now we have around 50%. With the teleschooling, the same, the infrastructure and the access to these technologies have been really massive moving into line. The SMEs and the restaurants and all the industries that have been locked down are using these technologies to survive. So I agree with some of the panelists. It's great to have them. But at the same time, if you don't have the protocols that you have offline in terms of when do you stop treating this information for the pandemic and when do you do not uh, turn it uh, into, into mass surveillance or, or for other purposes, uh, it's very important to have this global common agreement on how to deal with the regulatory frameworks. And this is something that UNESCO, uh, actually we were very pleased because our member states, I, I think they have this uh, 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 possibility of foreseeing that probably this was necessary. Uh, but in 2019, they asked UNESCO to develop the very first global standard on ethics of artificial intelligence. And I have to say that we are benefiting from the work that has been done in UNESCO on, on many areas to, on the universality of, of internet and the literacy and, and issues of skills for, for uh, mastering these technologies. But for the development of this recommendation that has been multi-stakeholder and also developed with the Global South that is not as represented as it should in these technologies, we of course stated that the whole purpose of these technologies uh, should be the respect of human rights, the enhancement of human rights and human dignity, uh, and actually uh, the development of new human rights that we may need in the, in the, uh, in the internet and in the digital world. Uh, but the fact is that we did not stop there. The 24 uh, experts that developed this uh, instrument, uh, because there has been so much movement in the regulatory frameworks internationally, they also ask, um, um, UNESCO not only to define what we're looking at, but also what tools can we use? What principles, as I said, the transparency, the accountability, the redressing mechanism, the proportionality, all these issues that you all know, uh, the governance of data, still we are lagging behind on how do we govern data? How do we ensure that the owner of the data is the individual and that he's not subjected to the misuse of his data for commercial purposes or other purposes? And therefore, they also ask us to go for very concrete policy solutions in the field of UNESCO, which is education, culture, communication, and sciences, and social inclusion. But in general, also to look at what tools can be, can be uh, developed. And I'm glad to share with all of you and with the public that is watching us that we are also uh, going to develop an ethical impact assessment. Because I think this is very important. It's not only about the digital divides, on gender, as Funsile has mentioned, or the impact on the environment. But it's also in the whole life cycle of the artificial intelligence deployment in terms of the research, development, deployment, measurement of impact and, and the black box and the machine learning, all these things. We really need to have a tool that will help us embed the ethical thinking and the questions, the right questions that we need to do 
to ensure that these impressive and amazing technologies deliver for good and not uh, for, for wrongdoing. Thank you very much. So investing in science, technology and innovation is essential for the economic prosperity and social progress of all humanity, especially this part of humanity in question that is completely devoid of its current research and development in the field of green technologies, for example, contribute to economic and social progress and allow to set up green economic paths that are ecological. And you have explained this UNESCO intervention schema in this particular context, especially at the level of countries that are largely atrophied from these new technologies. Thank you very much. And my question will be go to Mr. Mario Simoli. Mr. Mario Simoli, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean has a digital agenda under the coordination of ECLEC. How can a regional digital market help address the problems of poverty and inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean? And how can digital technologies support social inclusion and development in Latin America and Caribbean? Gracias, eh, gracias por la pregunta. Um, los procesos son Thank you very much for this question. These are processes that are fundamentally important. We can never forget technology, but technology does not necessarily always produces beneficial effect. Technologies can also increase uh, marginalization. Technology in itself is neither good nor bad. It all depends on how we use it. And that's why we should rethink the entire social inclusion process, taking into the, our way of thinking technology. Latin America needs a much broader digital market because every single country is too small for that in itself, none of the countries on its own is able or will be able to create a market like that. But creating a market for the entire Latin America based on the same language, on the same mentality, I think this would be possible. I think this could be done. We could successfully uh, conduct digitalization processes in various areas of activity. And I consider here also the common legal framework, standards, access relationships with the financial sector as well i think it would be very helpful to latin america also in the context of social inclusion what we need is a model where smes small and medium-sized enterprises as well as uh, other economic entities would have an equal access to the market, including the digital market, so that the smallest and the largest economy of the region could both equally enjoy uh, these solutions, available digital solutions. Social inclusion will not be possible if we don't have access to manufacturing for everyone. And here, once again, I would like to emphasize the role of SMEs. They deserve our support in this respect. What we need is a public policy for all that to happen and an active role of the government, but also an um, industrial policy, technological policy focused on solving social inclusion problems in Latin America. So more productivity, more social inclusion, it all calls for uh, including everyone, all the entities into this process. Thank you. Development that will involve international trade and integration by introducing these populations to managerial concepts and putting in place effective intervention plans that can positively address the technological and employment disparities in this important part of the world. Thank you, Mr. Simoli. And let me now ask Mr. Andrew Sullivan the following question. Mr. Sullivan, what are the fundamental properties of the internet that allow it to be the basis of social development? Uh, thank you. I, I think this is the heart of the question, uh, at least from my point of view. 
uh, because the internet has been uh, obviously super important in um, in human development uh, since it, it burst on the scene and, and in recent years. And it's been super important for us during this pandemic. And I think this is because of some basic qualities that the internet provides. Uh, the internet is uh, is, a, is an unusual technology. We, we talk about it as though it's a single thing, but it's made up of many different networks. It's made up of individual networks that are operated according to the individual priorities of those individual network operators. Uh, but it uses this common underpinning uh, that is the, the, the way in which all of these different networks collaborate with one another. Uh, and this collaboration turns out to provide certain advantages that no other networking technology has provided. And we at the Internet Society, we like to call this the Internet way of networking. Uh, it provides these mechanisms of decentralized control of shared building blocks, little building blocks that can be reused for other purposes. It has this common language of protocols and it creates an organic and open expansion of interconnectivity because you get innovation without having to get permission from any central authority. Those are the fundamental properties that give us the advantages that the internet provides. It, it allows new ideas to come to the fore without a great deal of centralized planning. And that has meant sometimes, of course, disadvantages. It has meant that there have been inventions that we find disadvantageous. But it also means that it gives us the freedom to deliver new, uh, new opportunities and new social development and new economic development for for people. It's what has allowed us to develop a technology that allowed, for instance, the example I was talking about earlier of the funeral that um, had to take place over the internet. Uh, what, what we're seeing is that uh, because of the challenges that people are facing with the internet, gradually there's been a tendency towards different kinds of regulation and those different kinds of regulation do not always take into account the special nature of the architecture of the internet. And that means that we, we could, by accident, lose the advantages uh, that the internet brings to us. We could do it just you know, through well-meaning, uh, well-intentioned uh, attempts to try to solve the problems that, uh, that we encounter. We could use the wrong tools for the job. Now, when we when we try to do physical development in the world, for instance, if you try to build a road or a pipeline or an airport or anything like that, uh, we do an environmental impact assessment. Most societies do that in order to decide, hey, is this a good idea? And so the Internet Society has developed uh, an, uh, a, a similar tool for the Internet. Uh, we have developed this Internet impact assessment tool. And that allows, uh, that allows similar sorts of evaluation of policy proposals in order to decide whether a given uh, approach to solving social problems is the one that's going to be most advantageous for the rest of the, of the development of the internet or whether it will be harmful to it. Uh, so that is a, a, a tool that you know, can be used in order to ensure that social development can continue through the internet. There's no question that this is one of the most human technologies that has ever been invented. The internet is here because it's to connect people. It's not just to have some sort of fun technological toy. It, it's been successful because it provides us with all of these benefits. And we need to remember that. And we need to make sure that decisions that we take about how to develop it as things go forward do not undermine the very thing that has brought us all of these advantages. And that's the reason that I think, you know, we need to do those kinds of impact assessments whenever we, um, uh, whenever we try to make a policy that's going to affect the way the internet is, because otherwise we will lose the social development that we can get through the internet simply by getting out of the way of people who have a problem and they have an idea for how to solve it. That has been the history of the best parts of the development on the internet. And I think that that is the way we should continue forward because the internet puts the power in the hands of the people who have the problem. That's the best place to solve, solve those problems. 
Thanks a lot, Mr. Sullivan. And uh, we should have to have equal access to these technologies around the world. And we were talking with you about the disparities existing in this context. But that does not prevent makes a common action in the direction of promoting this technology in the countries that need it must my question. My next question is addressed to Mr. Abunaba Ghosh. Mr. Arunabagosh, how can developed and developing countries alike leverage digital technologies to ensure that everyone, including vulnerable, vulnerable groups, have access to electricity and clean water even in times of emergency? Thank you for that question. And um, since I wasn't introduced right at the outset, let me the state that I am I are, I'm the CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, which is based here in India, but we work um, in other emerging economies as well. In response to your question, let me outline four specific ideas that have become even more um, relevant in the course of the pandemic and the kind of sustainable and just recovery that we expect out of it. The first, of course, is the access to energy for uh, not just power consumers in general, but particularly vulnerable groups and how could digitization and the internet help to do that, especially in the context of a pandemic. Um, one of the things that is happening increasingly is that for remote communities, there is a, there is a strong potential for what are called peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, through digital accounts and using blockchain as a way to ensure that those last mile transactions and last mile markets for energy trading actually get developed. This then permits the development of mini grid um, based energy access technologies, but also connecting the mini grids in far flung places to larger grid infrastructure. In India, uh, one utility here in Delhi, where I am based, is the first uh, distribution company that has used uh, the technology to trial a peer-to-peer solar-based trading. So you're now using um, clean energy, you're using digitization, and you're targeting vulnerable and poor communities to ensure that the, the uh, last mile infrastructure is able to deliver energy services. And this trial is being, being tried out for about six megawatts of existing solar infrastructure. But even more excitingly, um, our largest state, Uttar Pradesh, which has a population of more than 200 million and larger than most countries in the world, is the first state in India that has now got a regulatory framework to enable controlled peer-to-peer -peer energy trading via uh, blockchain as a mechanism to make those energy markets much more efficient. In fact, it would be the first in the world to be able to do that at the provincial level. That's one example. Another example is how do we respond in an emergency situation? The pandemic, of course, is one kind of emergency. But as another colleague on this panel was mentioning, climate change is another severe and rising emergency that we're all faced with. Now, in ex during extreme weather events, uh, how do we ensure that we can use um, more digitization to ensure that the most vulnerable and impacted communities are supported. So my organization, the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, has proposed an integrated emergency surveillance system that would, on one hand, combine an active database, an active database of uh, disaster emergency hotspots, and overlay that with a climate risk atlas with geotagged interfaces for critical infrastructure. No such climate risk atlas exists anywhere in the developing world. And if we were able to create that, then at a high resolution level, we'd be able to identify exactly how extreme weather events are unfolding or are likely to unfold. And that then links to a third component, which is to have a mon real-time monitoring uh, system to be able to guide the emergency services for post-emergency restoration. As the UN uh, itself identifies that investment in emergency preparedness uh, gives you $2 return 
in terms of lives saved and livelihoods saved against every dollar invested. And that res could result in billions of dollars of savings for vulnerable countries uh, facing climate emergencies. A third area is how we can protect small farmers using digitization. In India, for instance, um, a lot of the irrigation water comes from under the ground, uh, through groundwater, even though there is a big gap between the surface irrigation potential that is being created versus what is being used. This means that there's low returns on the high capital investment in the surface irrigation. Again, if we could use a network of wireless sensors via Internet of Things to monitor the soil water content and the soil nutrients, then the surface irrigation infrastructure could be used much more efficiently and deliver the right amount of uh, water supply to especially to small and marginal farmers. Uh, in fact, again, in the context of the pandemic, it's the agricultural sector in India that is demonstrating resilience, um, even as the urban economies are suffering severely. So the more we can help them and the more we can help small farmers, it's important. And finally, my fourth idea is to deal with micro, small and medium enterprises. Again, the colleague from Unido gave some very good examples of why that is an important uh, sector to support, and even the colleague from Latin America talked about this. We have proposed something called an MSME information system for holistic and real-time identification incentives and support. This would be a systematic um, online platform that would get data on the more than 60 million micro, small, and medium enterprises uh, in the country to be able to combine information on their energy usage, to be able to combine information on their outputs, as well as the tax collections, but also link it to the, the, the people employed so that in emergencies, again, any kind of direct benefits could be transferred to those enterprises or to their employees. So whether it is the issue of access to energy by creating viable payment systems for mini grids and distributed energy payments, uh, whether it is developing an integrated emergency surveillance system, whether it is supporting small farmers with data and the way to monitor the irrigation that they're using, or whether it is to support millions of micro, small and medium enterprises, the role of digitization, blockchain, internet of things, and a viable uh, information system that brings in the focus on vulnerable would be the right way to build back better. Thank you again. Thank you very much. So India's experience in this context is very attractive, very constructive and really effective. It will be beneficial to adopt the main axioms at the level of countries whose populations are in situation of massive vulnerability to draw inspiration from this approach in order to improve the daily lives of their populations by using new technologies. Thank you very much, Mr. Arunaba. And my next uh, question, my next question goes to Mr. Josh, Josh Kalmer. This is my question for you, Mr. Josh. Going back to the discussion on digital inclusion, how can tech companies work together with governments and other stakeholders to ensure that this becomes a reality in the near future? I'm hearing you. We are hearing you. Thank you, Ibtism, and uh, it's it's wonderful to, to be with all of you. I, I would. Um, focus on the example of education as an area where, where companies really have the opportunity to, to partner with governments and other non-governmental uh, stakeholders in general, just, just say that so many times tech companies and companies in general uh, see interactions with, with governments through sort of a defensive lens. What are the risks we face to our business? How can we avoid bad things from happening? And they miss the, the opportunity uh, to, to invest in trust relationships and to explore areas of, of partnership uh, that would really redound to the benefit, not just of governments, not just of companies, but of, of the world. And I think education is a perfect example of that. Um, I, I wouldn't be a good representative of, of my company, Zoom, if I didn't talk uh, a little bit about our product, but I think it is one of the main ways 
uh, that we could advance shared shared goals for, for government uh, and business and, and our kids. Um, so one thing that, that we did when the pandemic happened is we, we made the judgment that um, education was gonna be moving uh, remotely very quickly. And, and there are a lot of parts of the world uh, for, for whom digital technologies may be out of reach, either for technical reasons or financial reasons or both. Um, we're now supporting uh, over 125,000 schools with, uh, with, with free service around, around the world and, and looking to intensify. But you know, really get, giving away things for free or selling things to the government um, isn't what we're talking about, I don't think, when we're talking about these partnerships. I think the most important thing is that whether it's a Zoom in a video conferencing area or whether it's any tech company, is, is to, to really understand the, the, the needs, the priorities, the values of the governments and the societies in which they operate, um, and not just to respond to them, but to align ourselves with them, to embrace those values and priorities as our own and to work together to find ways to meet them. So very practically speaking, in the area of education, it's not just about uh, selling Zoom or giving Zoom away uh, for free, although that may be a piece of it, it's it's understanding what 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 do teachers in this country, whatever it is, need to be successful in using these kinds of technologies. How do we equip them to keep their classrooms, their virtual classrooms, safe? How do we design the product in a way that anticipates the needs that they may have? Uh, Gabriella was was speaking earlier about uh, control over over data, how do we make sure that we're protecting personal privacy, kids' privacy, and, and also ensuring that bad actors don't come onto the platform? And so there are just a whole range of things having to do with uh, the, the values and the priorities of the economies in which tech firms operate, that tech firms like Zoom, like others, need to embrace, need to internalize, and need to build into how we make our products, how we design our services, and how we interact with governments. We're gonna be, uh, to, to speak a little bit about our company, we are at the very beginning of a journey uh, that I'm putting together to develop these kinds of partnerships with governments around the world. And that's one reason it's such a privilege to be a part of this group today. But we will, uh, we, we, we take the challenge very seriously. We're looking forward to it and, and we're very committed to developing these kinds of partnerships so that tech companies and governments and NGOs and other stakeholders can really be rowing in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's true that it will take a lot of effort to start with the work well thought out, well done, continuous and above all, to trust each other and put in place effective driving schema that should guarantee the rights of all to a fair prosperity, then sustainable. Thank you, Mr. Kalmer. And my next question will be addressed to Mr. Rivi Lapalanian. Mr. Rivi Lapalanian. Fingo's main goal is to contribute to building a fairer world for all. What are the main challenges to building such a world from a social development perspective? And what does it take to make sure that digital technologies can help address these challenges as opposite to amplifying them? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thanks for the question. Uh, smartphones caused a huge disruption in almost everything in our lives. And the radical transparency, the rapid possibility of the real-time communication and the multiplication of information created a new reality to which companies, organizations and societies continue to try to adapt. The change is comparable in the scale to the emergency of printing skills and we are only at the beginning of that change. The return of the concentration of power, authoritarian leaders and a powerful state to the force that characterized the global operating environment can be seen. And at the same time, there's also the strong counter trend that challenges the concentration of power and the competition for the great power. There have emerged fact actors who have no official power, but who are capable of challenging the power of states and even the global order. And at the same time, the people's individual influence continues to grow with the new communication technologies. 
power of states mixed with a complex operating environment where the group of individuals or the movement formed around one thing can challenge the debate and the familiar hierarchy of, of power. Overall, the exercise of power becomes more difficult as more actors are able to exercise the power. However, the decentralization of power also provides unprecedented opportunities to bring to the global agenda the issues that arise from people's needs and aspirations in relation to their own security. And for example, in peace talks, there are weak signals that the agendas are changing the interest of the great powers towards the own needs of the local people and the common dialogue. And through the participation and inclusion, lasting stability can be created on the terms that people genuinely need. It is essential for the governments, companies, organizations to understand these ways of influencing. They also need to create new means to respond to the crises created by the change situation. And in the Edelman Trust, uh, Trust Barometer Global Trust Survey, as many as 76% of people were worried about using the fake news as an attack on society. Almost all of our operations are connected in one way to another to the platforms provided by the smartphones. And platforms not only accept our actions and what, do, what we do as they are, but their logic also guides people's actions in line with the logic of the platforms. And it is therefore justified to talk about the platform societies nowadays. Internet activists uh, Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms have created an interesting practical division between the new and the old power. And the traditional power is closed. It is not easy to access. And when it is obtained, its use is strictly regulated. Such power can be compared, for example, to money. The new power, in turn, works differently. It is symbolically like flowing water. It arises when enough people participate. It is open, inclusive, and being empowered by peers. Like a flowing river, it is at its strongest when it floods. The sign of the new power it is not the ability to retain an exercise of power, but to involve people around the issue and channel the resulting movement. In addition to content creation, the new exercise of power also concludes, uh, includes content sharing, editing, financing, production, and co-ownership. And the traditional institutions and intermediaries such as banks or newspapers or rep representative democracy are ignored. Thus, this power is not only redistributed, but also empowers people into actors in the fields where it has not previously been possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And by the way, I just want to say that a uh, lot of things uh, has uh, changed by this uh, pandemic. Uh, and we have to learn other ways to imagine the life in different countries of the world. Thank you, Mr. Rili Lapalian. And my last question is addressed to Mr. to Ms. Claire Benamed. Uh, Mrs. Claire Benamed. It is probably safe to say that at the moment, the potential of data to contribute to sustainable development is not fully taped into. What policies can governments and the private sector put in place to allow data to be used for social good? And succeeding, I, yes, yes, please, please answer. Uh, we I are all here. <laughs> Thank you very much. And let me say, first of all, I completely agree that it is absolutely safe uh, and very true to say that at the moment we're not using all of the data and the resources that are available to, to analyze data in the best way uh, for the public good. And of course, that is perhaps bad news from the point of view of the quality of decision making now, but it also presents an exciting opportunity around what we can do to improve the situation. Um, so we work with governments around the world on bringing together the public and the private sectors to answer, to, to tackle specific challenges that are limited, where, where lack of data is limiting progress on the sustainable development goals. Um, and from that experience over several years now and over spread, having brokered 
over 70 partnerships, um, some at a very specific national or local level and some regional or global. I think um, for us, there are a number of things that stand out that really have to happen if data is to make its full contribution and data particularly from some of the resources and technologies that we have now, thanks to the internet and digital technologies. The first, of course, as always in any, almost any area of public policy is political leadership and that being seen through into the creation of a regulatory framework that will um, create the, the possibility for a positive interaction. Of course, in the, in the um, area of digital that has to set a fair market competition. And critically, as we see again and again around the world, that has to build public trust. We've seen many data projects that fail because people don't give their consent because they do not make, they, they don't allow governments to do to, um, to enact laws or to begin projects that may be beneficial because they sometimes rightly don't trust that the government will protect their data, will protect them, and instead they fear that it will be used to harm them in some way. So the first, the first policies that need to be put in place is a framework that will guarantee trust, that will create fair competition, and that most importantly will guarantee um, public trust, but it doesn't end there. Too often we think about policy as the beginning and also the end of the process. And I think what we see again and again is that it's not just about policy, but it's also about some quite deep cultural changes that have to happen within institutions. Too often within government, um, data is seen as something that has to be hoarded. Governments that often government departments don't even want to share data with each other. So I think the first thing that has to happen is a kind of cultural change to say that data isn't something that you have to keep and it's the source of your power. In fact, data becomes more powerful the more it's shared and the more it's combined with other data sources to be used in different ways. That's a very fundamental culture change that needs to happen, first of all, within governments. But also, I think for, I would love to see that happen within markets as well that market behavior and market incentives would, would reward companies that created tools and platforms that enabled interoperability and data sharing rather than creating kind of walled gardens where once you're locked into one product, you can only ever use that product. Of course, companies need to pursue their quite legitimate pursuit of profit, but I would love to see the market evolving in a way where consumers could, find, could encourage companies to find ways to combine profit with a much stronger drive towards interoperability and, um, and combining data sources. So I think really what we need to see is, first of all, policy change to set the framework. Secondly, cultural change to set, to set those good things in motion. And then the third thing I think is the democratization of data production and use, and actually a much stronger sharing of the tools and capacities and the ability and the confidence, I think we probably all remember moments in our school days where if not us, then somebody else was, oh, I can't do maths. Oh, I'm terrible at this. I would love to see that kind of culture disappear and everybody feel that they had the tools and the confidence to use this data. Data shouldn't just be something that is done to people, but something that they can positively interact with themselves to define their own reality and set their own terms and make their own decisions. So for me, the three key things here are, are first of all, a strong policy environment to guarantee security. Secondly, a culture change that drives interoperability and sharing. And thirdly, democratization, so that we all have the ability to use these amazing tools that are now at our disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have to be to set this internment to get relationship economically beneficial to all parties, both governmental and private, in order to create a sensitive and sustainable prosperity of the people in the greatest challenge that seems important to us to meet by all. Thank you all for this very fruitful exchange around this very important topic on the role of the internet and new technologies in the creation of sustainable development. And when we come to the final question of our session, 
that I will ask you all, I wish ask you each to answer in one minute and I will start with Minister um, Paula Pizan is not uh, with us. So I start with our uh, guest, uh, Mrs. Uh, Paula. What are the commitments we take uh, into this uh, session? This is clear, this is clear. Sorry, please, you cut out there. Please, please, please state what, what specific. I wasn't able to hear the question. My, my, hello. Please state, state one specific recommendation on what should be done to ensure that the internet is a force for social good. Please choose one of these uh, stakeholder groups for this recommendation for concrete action, either government, private sector, the cyber society, or the United Nations system. Thank you. Well, I already talked about governments and the private sector. So let me just now close the loop by also saying for civil society, what I feel as someone who is very much involved with governments and companies in the particularly at the data end is sometimes a lack of engagement by civil society. And I would love to see a much stronger engagement by civil society defining the internet and the protections that they would like to see. Not that necessarily that would what, what would happen or that everybody would agree, but I think a much stronger voice for civil society would help to drive everybody in the right direction and give those governments that want to act the legitimacy and the support to do so. And, and also change uh, at the margins, help to shift markets towards positive outcomes for all. So I would love to see a stronger voice for civil society, not always opposing, but saying what they want to see, giving us a positive agenda for this area. Thank you. Thank you. I ask now um, Mrs. Pumzila Mbinambunguka to give us uh, her voluntary commitment to support the internet for social group. Uh, in one minute, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would actually like to see uh, regulatory interventions that are both encouraging uh, and supportive uh, to uh, uh, governments uh, supporting the efforts of both the uh, private sector, civil society, communities, uh, as well as greater private sector, public sector collaboration uh, in enabling uh, the those uh, who live in technology poor communities to have access. And I would also like uh, more investment in building a, a pipeline of uh, young people through STEM subjects who would have an appetite and an interest to uh, participate effectively in uh, the world that technology uh, uh, promises. In other words, a, an ecosystem that is mutually reinforcing from different uh, sectors, uh, role players, uh, that is all aimed at increasing the uptake and participation at affordable or no cost, uh, which is a uh, open source. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Youngly, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, from my experience uh, uh, for the past few years of the uh, uh, digital uh, technology development, uh, fourth industrial revolution, I think uh, one of the issue is uh, just uh, like a bottleneck for the uh, digital technology is digital infrastructure. Uh, I uh, have a strong feeling that uh, the government should play the key role working together with privacy at a private company to develop a digital infrastructure, just like highway, railway, airways. Uh, without the digital infrastructure, all those new technologies uh, uh, cannot be run. Uh, and uh, even the uh, 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 vocational trainings uh, through the visual reality training system and cannot be applied. This is a, a fundamental issue. Uh, I believe that uh, the government should play the role and the development financial institution provide assistance and a private sector will be a, a one of the key players. Uh, this is a, a fundamental issue. 
when we talk about the digital infrastructure, digital technologies, application of that, redu reducing the digital di divide. Thank you very much. Ms. Yongi, thank you very much. And now I address the same question to Madame Gabriela, Gabriela Ramos. Well, our, our commitment uh, and our hope, <laughs> because we are an international institution, is that the instruments that we have developed and the instruments that we are developing, like the recommendation of ethics of artificial intelligence, uh, but before, I have to say that in 2015, we have the uh, Internet Universality Framework. Uh, we contributed to the Secretary General Roadmap with the, with the three CCs on uh, artificial intelligence to, to connect, to protect, to respect and remedy. So we have many tools uh, that have been advanced for the purpose of what we have been discussing today, which is to put the people at the center of these technologies not, all, not only for them to master the technologies and to protect their own rights and their human uh, 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 dignity, but also for, for them to shape the technological revolution. I think this is very important. And so we will really make our instruments count and we will work with people, with the stakeholders to make sure that they are empowered not only to use and have access to the technologies, which is the first derivative of the digital di di divide, but more importantly, to shape the technological revolution, not to have all these minorities absent, not, not to have all these women absent, not to have the global South absent. I think it's very important that they understand the, the, the real uh, benefits that these technologies bring, but how they need to shape it and how they need to protect themselves to, to advance their own, their own rights. Uh, so hopefully UNESCO will continue making a strong contribution in this field. Thank you very much, Madame Gabriela. Thank you, UNESCO. And we are, uh, what have you to say for us in the same context, Mr. Mario Simoli? Gracias, muy amables. Eh, la propuesta es muy inmediata. Pensamos que en una situación de crisis grave como la que hay, los gobiernos conjuntamente. Thank you very much for this question. I think we are now in a crisis situation, an emergency situation, and under the circumstances, both the government and the public and the private sector have to guarantee that digital services are available to entire societies, most of all the disadvantaged communities. This is the only way for us to uh, go through this crisis successfully for 40% of our population access to digital services is key. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, are you with us? I, I am, I'm sorry, uh, the, the translation was talking over you. Um, so, thank you so much. The, uh, the Internet Society wants people to be able to do the evaluations that they need to in order to in order to figure out whether various policies are the right ones. So we will continue to develop case studies of the uh, of various policies in order to determine how they fit with the internet way of networking. And we're very happy to work with anybody in the world who wants to uh, wants to do those analyses of various proposed policies. So that's the commitment that we're willing to make right now. Thank you very much, Mr. Arunava Gush. We're waiting for your commitment. Thank you. As uh, one of Asia's leading uh, policy institutions working on sustainability, our focus has been to democratize data, and that is our commitment. In, our, uh, in the last 10 years, we have made more than 100 data sets, um, either created them or made them available. We lost Mr. Arunaba. So I give. I. Hi, can Mr. you hear me? Mr. Arunaba, are you yes. with, can you hear with me? us? Yes. You... Yes. 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 I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, I was saying that our our main commitment is to make access to data um, as much as possible available to the public at large. We have either created or made more than one hundred data sets on access to energy, water, industrial production and emissions, et cetera, available everywhere so that the, that can be used for incisive policy interventions. Um, that commitment will continue. 
but our, um, our ask of governments is to ensure that data that is generated by civil society is granted the kind of status that is needed because often that's where there is a lot more detailed and granular information available. And especially when we talk about creating things like a climate risk atlas that can save millions of lives affected by um, uh, extreme weather events over the coming decades. That's the kind of uh, visioning that we need for a democratized data architecture that is then delivered to both the public at large, but also uh, the, the, the government services that need to respond. Thank to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And as a last word, uh, your commitment, Mr. Josh Cameron. Great, thank you. Um, I well, I, I of course can't speak for other companies in the uh, the tech sector, but on behalf of Zoom, um, we can commit and we do commit to to always working to internalize the priorities and values of governments, uh, to designing our products in ways that take those values and priorities into account, and in giving people tools uh, to use them safely and securely. Uh, one recommendation I have, going back to the education context is actually to put something together and to, and to have the UN uh, perhaps convene, say by the end of the first quarter of 2021, a half day symposium bringing together uh, tech companies, uh, governments, non-governmental stakeholders to start working through, perhaps in the context of education in particular, ways that we can really drive inclusion together and to start actually taking practical steps to do so. I know Zoom would be an enthusiastic participant uh, in, in, such a, in such a setting. And so I will uh, put that idea out there for, for you to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roshkamer. And now we go to Mr. Rini Lapalian. What's your last commitment, Mr. Lapalian? Well, I think there are two points. The first is coming back to the civil society, which I'm, I'm representing. And I think that we have quite a lot of work to do still internally. So really sharing about the ex examples, really uh, making our promises and, and um, making the implementation of the principles for the development, uh, digital development. So really homework, co-creation, really learning by doing and, and all of that. But then on the other hand, I'm, I'm really having the request for, especially for the governments, so that exactly there is the access for the civil society to participate because it's not really happening in every countries. And I think that there's a lot of data, for example, like we heard that the civil society is collecting, which could be really, really relevant and useful for the governments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all. And at the end, uh, before we close this session, I just want to say something. It's uh, my commitment, if you want, in French language, so, because we are in the United Nations, a multilinguist uh, space, I just want to say, il n'est pas douteux que les nouvelles technologies, le progrès numérique, donneront de nouvelles jouissances à l'homme à travers la planète. Et pourquoi It's pas... absolutely obvious that new technologies are a new way to save our planet. So we have to do the utmost to make sure that new digital technologies allow us to develop humanity in a very positive direction so that we create uh, permanent values, that we create initiatives for the benefit of everyone. This is our goal, our aim. It's not something we have already accomplished. It's a sort of an ideal that we pursue together as a humanity. All these issues are also an opportunity for us an opportunity to create very realistic new stages to accomplish new goals so that together as humanity we finally uh, progress together. We have to remember that still much remains to be done and so we have to evaluate things that have already been done that we do ourselves. And within the UN fora, we should perhaps evaluate uh, our actions and activities. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope we will have a chance to meet again in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ibiten, and thank you very much to our panelists.
and um, thank you to the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Pleasure Goodbye. to on the discussion. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much.